Yeah, it's true. Electronics can be, at times, a little complex. But as soon as you go in and break things down to a component level, you'd just be shocked at how simple some of these things are. Like, for instance, probably the simplest part there is. By simply taking a wire conductor and wrapping it around a piece of iron I have created my very own inductor Now, you might not have heard an awful lot about them, but what they do is pretty amazing, especially considering their simple construction. An inductor, or coil as it's sometimes called, is just that, a coil of wire conductor wrapped around a core. Now, the core is often made of iron, but it could also be plastic or even air, like this one. When current from a DC power supply starts to flow forward through a coil, some of its uh, initial energy is stored in an electromagnetic field around the coil. As you may have guessed, this electromagnetic field is the basis for electromagnets. And electromagnets are used like everywhere. Well, a lot of places. Motors, solenoids, relays, tons of stuff. They're super useful. We can make a small electromagnet using just a D cell battery an iron nail and some enameled wire. Now, enameled wire looks like it's bare, but it actually has a clear enamel insulator. Just wind the wire around the nail, keeping the coil as tight as possible, keeping the windings right next to each other. Keep working your way down until you've covered most of the nail. The more windings you use, the stronger the electromagnet will be. Once you're done, pull a length off to connect to our battery. Strip off the ends, make sure that I can get good contact, connect to the D cell battery. Once the coil builds up its field, it's just a straight conductor, the short to the battery's positive and negative terminals, which also means that it can get very hot. Just to avoid any more little finger burns, I'm going to use a small piece of wood to hold the wire on to the negative terminal. Lay out some test subjects, connect, and magnetization has been achieved. And of course, when we let go, if we suddenly cut the power to the coil, the inductor's field will begin to weaken as it transfers its energy back into the circuit, keeping that current moving forward until the field strength is all used up. It's easy to see the action of inductance 
by using a square wave pass through a coil. I built a little square wave generator. We can take a look at its normal output first on the oscilloscope. We see our nice predictable square wave. Zero volts up to about seven volts. Back down to zero, seven, over and over again. Now, I'll leave that first probe hooked up and connect a second, seeing the signal after it's passed through an inductor. Ah, much different. Curvy. And that curviness, that makes sense. It'd probably be easier to see if I just overlaid the original square wave signal. Ah, there we go. When the supply goes from zero to seven volts, the inductor uses a large amount of energy to start filling up its electromagnetic field. As it gets closer and closer to being at capacity, it uses less and less until it's totally full and the inductor lets the full seven volts go out. Once the signal suddenly drops back down to zero volts, the inductor empties out its field, pushing current forward in the direction it had been going. And if I speed the wave up, you can see that it's shying away from passing that full seven volts. Like right here, not even getting there and it's not even dropping all the way down to zero. If you had a varying signal faster than this, you wouldn't see much change at all. Now this filling up and emptying of an electromagnetic field makes the inductor seem kind of reluctant to change. It's pretty slow in conducting quick changes. That might sound like kind of a bad trait at first, but it can be really useful when we want to remove spikes and dips from a power supply's output. That brings up another important use, actually. The heart of power supplies is a transformer, which is basically just two coils sharing one core. Now, by using two coils, a transformer can transmit electrical energy from one circuit to another without actually connecting them. When a varying current is applied to one coil, it creates, of course, a varying magnetic field around the secondary coil as well. And that secondary coil reacts to the changes by causing, or more accurately, inducing a corresponding varying current across its leads. And that's called mutual induction. The original voltage can be reduced by using a different number of coil windings in the secondary. Still just doesn't look quite. Here we go. Angry transformer. Wow, looks like he's gonna threaten the city. Yeah, anyway. Well, like I said before, it's pretty amazing, right? I mean, all that can be done using just a simple coil of wire. Who knew? Well, actually, the first two to know were Joseph Henry and Michael Faraday. Both of them conducted experiments with electromagnets in 1831 and were the first people to document electrical inductance. Though Faraday's work was actually published first, the unit of measurement for inductance became known as the Henry. What's up, Henry? 
uh, Mr. Henry. Uh, don't feel bad, though, because uh, Faraday got the Farad named after him, so it's okay. 